Before I get into the scripture lesson, there's a couple of comments. One, excuse me. Um, I got to thinking during the last song, uh, the Sunday school teachers are not going to be too happy with me. They're not here. Oh, well, who's ever taking care of the kids? you got to keep those baseballs off the wall. Um, the other thing is that, again, in the announcements, and normally um, we don't read announcements out loud that are uh, in the bulletin, but since we sort of danced on that principle today, um, Bethel United Church of Christ in White Salmon, Washington is the church that we are uh, praying for today. You notice that their pastor is Adam Erickson. Adam is a graduate of Forest Grove High School. Adam graduated in 1998 and has uh, had a career in, in serving people and serving his God. So pray for uh, Bethel United Church of Christ in White Salmon and for Adam Erickson. Our scripture this morning is from a multitude of Old Testament sources. In Psalm 71, we sing the song that praises God in our youth. Spoiler alert here, we only read through the eighth verse this morning. Someday we'll read the remainder that tells us, even in our old age, the faithfulness of God does not waver. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress as to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust, and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. In the next two selections from Proverbs and Isaiah, we see the good and the necessity to do justice. And I'm always reminded of the book of Micah, where he asks what's required of us, but to show mercy, seek justice, and to walk humbly with our God. From Proverbs, when justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to the evildoers. And from Isaiah, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And our final selection from Ecclesiastes, we get the cautionary tale of oppression and the oppressors. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. Look, the tears of the oppressed with no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power with no one to comfort them. We have been um, looking at refuge during Lent, and we have our prayer shawls on the communion table as a visual expression of that comfort of being wrapped in love. But I started thinking about how our dominant culture has taught us that we can have what we want without considering the cost that that may have to others. The culture in the United States has um, been pretty much take what you want from whomever you want, because we're bigger and better and we deserve it. And that led me to thinking about privilege and racism 
And why do we believe the way we do? Often in direct conflict with what our faith tells us to do. I, I sit on the board of directors for the um, Central Pacific Conference, our conference, and we've been doing a lot of work on the conference goal of becoming a non-racist church conference. Um, one of the and one of the cool things that happened recently, about 18 months ago. Okay, so when you guys joined the church, did you get the lesson on the four streams that became the United Church of Christ? The four streams um, are congregational, the congregation church, the Christian church, evangelical church, and the reformed church. And sometime in the 50s, they all became the United Church of Christ, 1957. So about 18 months ago, the um, United Church of Christ decided, the Historical Council voted that the Afro-Christian tradition was going to be recognized as the official fifth stream. And this article was written by Hans Holtznagel, one of our, one of our products. Um, and it says, the, um, the council voted that it acknowledges and affirms the Afro-Christian convention as the fifth stream of the UCC historical legacy. The historical council will celebrate the concept of the fifth stream and engage fully in the dissemination and promotion of a new text that talks about being the fifth stream through all possible means. And I thought that was a really cool thing. It's a, it's a big in your face step, finally recognizing the Afro-American church's contribution to our church. And now we're all the, all the church. Um, and even with that great stride, we have to recognize the history of the United Church of Christ also includes some, you know, ugly stuff and some not fair stuff and some oppressive stuff. We aren't the only denomination that has that history. Um, but we have the knowledge now of how misguided we were, and we can't pretend we don't anymore. So I've been thinking about racism, and um, I'm racist. Not the, uh, I'm gonna exclude you on purpose because of your color racist, but racist with internalized beliefs the ones that came with my upbringing and my culture and my family. And, and here are some examples. So like, I was at Elmer's a couple weeks ago and two Latina women walked in, in their 50s I'm guessing. My first thought was, how could those women afford to eat here? Aren't they supposed to be working? Because my, oh, I just wanna cry saying that out loud. My culturization was, middle-aged Latina women clean houses. That's what I grew up with. And um, I see families of color at Disneyland, and I think, how can they afford to come to Disneyland? Not a second later, I thought, Terry, you and your family are only at Disneyland because someone signed you in. You can't afford to come to Disneyland. <laughs> but that was my thought. Um, I saw this great photo of two celebrities, one very, very black African-American and one very pasty white Anglo, and they were hugging. And my mind went, oh, that's wrong, because that's how I was raised. And the next thought was, no, Terry, it's fine. But my first thoughts are those racist thoughts. And um, when I was doing my training at Emmanuel, I found myself in an elevator with a black man just the two of us. And my thought was, our great grandmothers must be having kittens at the thought of a white woman and a black man in an elevator together. So um, it, it's there, it's there and it's in us. And, and one of the things I realized, I'm, I love to read, I'm reading these books. The only time characters are described by their color in our books are if they're brown or black. The default is white. We just assume it's white, but then it'll say his brown skin. Like, oh my gosh. 
So we had a meeting a while back about changing the stained glass window. And I was pretty emotional as I heard what I considered racist statements. And I know I hurt feelings. And I probably um, uh, angered people. Um, but what I know now is what I was hearing was this socialized racism. The, the stuff that's ingrained in our culture, not individual, I'm a racist racism. We deny being racist, but we don't realize how much of our understanding is rooted in racism, saturated. So going back to our conference work, we were introduced, here we go, Hope. We were introduced to the um, white supremacy culture toxins. And this was the graphic that they gave us. And I know you can't read them, but it's just a wonderful um, example of like, these are poisons, don't breathe them in. And so right now, I want you to get out a pencil or a pen, and you're gonna write two things down, and quite serious. Do you guys have pens or pencils in there? Um, these are two sources that, if you haven't done any race work yourself, these are great places to start. If you have been doing a lot of race work, they're great places to go to. The first is whitesupremacyculture.info. Whitesupremacyculture.info. I'm using Michael Colvin as my guide to see who writes fast. Whitesupremacyculture.info. Then there's an Instagram page called Racial Equity Insights. And this guy just talks about um, how you think you're not racist, but maybe you are, or how to answer questions when someone says something to you that's overtly racist. So Racial Equity Insights. And I can't tell you the power that those two places have had um, in highlighting how insidiously and intentionally these toxins have been used to create our culture. They are the antithesis of what Jesus taught, the antithesis of the belief in the power of God, that distilled essence of God, which is, yes. Would you read that list? Oh, I will read this list. I, I'm gonna read it to you, but know that just reading it is gonna cause more questions in your head. So that's why you've gotta to go to that thing. Um, either or thinking, worship of the written word, objectivity, individualism, quantity over quality, power hoarding, fear of open conflict, sense of urgency, defensiveness, paternalism and parentalism, uh, progress is bigger, I think, uh, belief in one right way, the right to comfort, and perfectionism. And some of them seem really innocuous, but when you get in and see how these things have been shaped by the dominant culture, it's pretty eye-opening. Um, so what is white supremacy culture? And as I read this, you're gonna recognize that it's all around us, that, that we're in a white supremacy culture. It's the widespread ideology baked into the beliefs values, norms, and standards of our groups. Many, if not most of them. Our communities, our towns, our states, our nation, teaching us both overtly and covertly that whiteness holds value. Um, it teaches us that blackness is not only valueless, but dangerous and threatening. It teaches us that indigenous people and communities no longer exist. Um, I come from Southern California and Dodger Stadium is built in Chavez Ravine. And before Dodger Stadium built, was built, Chavez Ravine was home to a whole 
whole indigenous colony of, um, of um, Ind Indian and Mexican people. And they wanted a baseball stadium. So everyone was um, removed. Um, or if indigenous cultures do still exist, they're exoticized or romanticized or culturally appropriated because we continue to violate treaties and land rights and humanity. It teaches us that people south of the border are illegal, that Arabs are Muslim and Muslim is terrorist. It teaches us that people of Chinese and Japanese and Asian descents are indistinguishable and threatening um, because they're the reason for COVID. And it pits races and groups against one another and always defines them as inferior to the white group. So it's reflected in the disproportionate number of people of color in jail and schools and access to books and you guys know all this. Um, this was an interesting fact. One in seven children in our country go to bed hungry. This means, and, and the majority of them are people of color, but that means that our country accepts that level of hungry and food insecurity as normal. And if it didn't think it was normal, we wouldn't allow it. So white supremacy culture is this society that, that prioritizes profit over people. And um, if we didn't have these dominant cultural beliefs that make people, that make people think this is normal, um, it's inhumane. I heard once that what is tolerated becomes accepted. And this stuff is an acceptable behavior for humans. And I believe that Jesus would be calling us not to tolerate it. So, and it comes after us all. I mean, we're swimming in it. We're swimming in it. Um, we're asked to join and collude. We internalize, inevitably internalize these messages because this is what we've been taught is normal our whole lives. I'm speaking for myself, but I'm assuming it's, you know, pretty out there. Um, the good news is that while it informs us, it doesn't define us. And anything that's constructed can be deconstructed or replaced. So we're not victims. Our history is both witness and record of how many people refused to cooperate. How many of us were brave and bold enough to vision a future we may not live to see? We honor those radical freedom fighting ancestors and Jesus was the first one. Well, I don't know if he was the first one. He's the one we know about. Freedom fighting ancestor, radical freedom fighting ancestor. Those on the front lines some of them whose names we'll never know. They offer nurture while committed to living with dignity and respect and love. We're here because of them. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking truth to power. For standing out for the least, the lost, the lonely. Didn't work out real well for Jesus. We all know how that ended. But... Considering the short time that Jesus was alive, his lessons have had thousands of years of longevity and have changed the world. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of these toxins. Oh my gosh, I could go on forever. Um, the toxin of fear, white supremacy culture, their number one fear is to make us afraid. And all of these things are driven by fear. We fear not being good enough, not being enough, not being lovable. When we're afraid, especially if we don't have the skills to manage that fear, we're very easily manipulated by a false but powerful sense of security and safety. The promise safety is always false because it's based on abuse and misuse of power, and it shows up as everything from little tiny aggressions 
to major violence. Um, it disconnects us from each other across racial identities. Fear disconnects us from each other within our racial groups. Fear disconnects us from the earth, the wind, the sky, the creatures, and it disconnects us from our source, from God, creativity or spirit or whatever you want to call that great other and that wisdom that we carry inside us. White supremacy culture has the power to, to use fear to divide us. Always in the profit, always in the service of profit and power for a few at the expense of many of us. But scripture tells us something different about fear. Um, in John, there's no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Even though, this is uh, Psalms, though I walk through the valley of darkness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Another one, don't fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. <sighs> One of you guys are lefties besides me. Thank you. God will uphold us with his righteous left hand as well. And God says, or Bible says a lot about community, about how we gather strength from each other. We are stronger together. Stronger when we share with each other our fears, our hurts, our anger, our joy. Kept in internal darkness, fear is the boogeyman. And it has a lot of power. But when we expose that fear to the light, we take away its power. It's no accident that Jesus was called the light of the world. Sharing our stuff deepens and strengthens our bonds to one another and it, it gives us the capacity to care for one another and for ourselves. Um, white supremacy culture teaches us to internalize that stuff and those behaviors and it doesn't do anyone any good. Um, okay, either or thinking, boy there's so much. I'll do either or thinking and then I'll stop. Um, you gotta go to this website, you guys. <laughs> So either or thinking is that we reduce the complexity of life to yes, no, right, wrong, either or. And that shows up as um, presenting options that are either, either or, good, bad, right, wrong, binary, nothing in between. Um, no possibilities of both and. And it tries to simplify complex things. You, you can't say, oh, poverty is the result of a lack of education. It's way more complex than that. Every time you mention one thing, there are 20 rabbit holes. You can't say yes, no. Um, conflict and an increased sense of urgency are, are um, aspects of either or thinking. We have to get this done right now, so we have to make a decision. We have to decide right now. But what if you can't decide right now? Sometimes things are big. And it's also a strategy that's used by some people to push an agenda. Yep, you're with us or you're not. You're with us or you're not. And there is not much worse than being excluded. We want to be included. We want to be loved and cared for. So um, there are antitoxins for these toxins. Antidotes. And um, antidotes here for either or thinking are, notice when you're hearing either or language, and um, try to make time to come up with alternatives. Or notice when you're simplifying complex issues, especially when the stakes are high or an urgent decision needs to be made. Um, binary thinking, the, the either or thinking, um, and problem solving favor the powerful. And Jesus told us, if you want to be first, you have to be last. Whoever welcomes this little child 
welcomes me because among you, this one is the greatest. And even in the Magnificat, Mary, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. He has looked with favor on his lowly servant. Have mercy on those who, who fear him in every generation. He has shown the power of his arm and scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away empty. Um, last one, toxin of the written word, worship of the written word. Um, worship of the written word doesn't mean you can read and write well. This is um, this is our our culture's insistence on things like if it wasn't written down, didn't happen. Those of you who work in healthcare know this from charting. You got to chart it all because if it's not in the chart, didn't happen. Um, if it's not grammatically correct, it has no value. And who does that benefit? People who are well educated. Um, if it's not properly cited, according to academic rules, that many people don't know or have access to, it's not legitimate. And these are ways that white supremacy culture, which is really, really evident in academia, keeps different thinking, keeps oral traditions, keeps different kinds of things from becoming part of the mainstream. Um, and of course, the antidotes look at what's going on and analyze, eh, this doesn't quite feel right. Recognize the contributions and skills that everyone brings. Um, dedicate time to practicing and honoring other ways of knowing and expression. Oral tradition, hello, is our Bible, Old Testament, oral tradition? We revere the heck out of that. Storytelling, visual, movement, art, all of those things are valid communication responses that don't require words. Um, there's a big, the big toxin of defensiveness and denial. Boy, we could go on on that one forever, but I won't because it's getting close. Um, so, so some of the things you have to do, this is such big stuff and it it feels personal it's not a hit personal it's a hit to change our world so we have to stop defending ourselves defensively and say tell me more understand your racism or your collusion in racism as conditioning it's conditioning it's not who we essentially are or you wouldn't be here this morning understand that the awareness of your conditioning has to be necessary. You've got to know it and own it before you can work on changing it. Call yourself in, not others out. Do this. There's so many good things. So I want to read this poem that um, talks about how hard this is. And then I have one closing paragraph. Um, this is an, a new poet I have found named Shailen Harkin, and she lives here in the Pacific Northwest. And she calls this, Awakening is Messy. Awakening is Messy. You don't transcend in some paradisiacal elitist inner garden. It doesn't perfect you. You first come into all the reasons you've so wanted to stay asleep. And there are many good reasons. To awaken really is to begin to feel. Awakening is bit by bit coming out of denial around all the reasons you've needed to wield that terrible tool of othering. Because so much is unbearable inside ourselves. It is dividing the cracks in our hearts rather than mortaring them. It does not look like being perfectly empowered or seamlessly composed. It's to commit with all your heart to no longer taking your helplessness out on someone else. Awakening, awakening has nothing to do with 
stern, stoic spirituality. It has nothing to do with finally being aloof enough to not be impacted by the gifts of your feelings. Awakening doesn't come from spiritual mastery defined as overcoming our shortcomings. It is found in doing our fumbling best to grow into arms strong and loving enough to hold and hug our aching humanity. The myth that awakening looks anything like spiritual perfection is perhaps the best sleeping pill. Awakening is at times compassless and often an inglorious inner odyssey toward the rough ruby of all that is bruised and true in our hearts. Awakening isn't only for special people. We are all on our way toward coming out of the sleep cycle. This is a lot. But I think it can be collapsed into a way of action by loving as God loves, without judgment, without fear, openly admitting we don't know everything, and remembering that each and every one of us is made in the image of God and is a beloved child of God, you will never look into the eyes of someone God does not love. Amen.